Okay, excellent, great. All right, um, hi, uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll be brief because I realize that I am the only thing standing between you and a break uh, before the, um, before the uh, competition. Uh, so I just wanted to share some, some thoughts about a recent project that I was lucky enough to be involved with. Uh, and it was uh, actually bringing um, some outside expertise in robotics uh, to Myanmar, uh, or to Burma, uh, as the country was uh, formerly known. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit more uh, in this presentation about the project itself, the need, uh, what, was actually, what was actually done, and then some of the impact that we're, we're trying to measure um, in this case. And so I have a couple of co-authors, uh, two talks, and uh, Joao Dutra, who are both uh, actually um, uh, stationed in Myanmar, in uh, Yangon, in the capital. So, okay, so this was a uh, robotics education program. It was my first foray into um, education overseas in a developing nation, uh, in particular in Myanmar. So if you're not familiar, and uh, several years ago, until I was lucky enough to go uh, on a trip uh, for vacation to Myanmar, um, if you're not familiar with the country, um, it's a nation of about 54 million people in Southeast Asia that borders Thailand, uh, China, uh, India, uh, several different regions. Um, and uh, its, uh, its largest city is Yangon. They moved the capital recently, fairly recently, but the largest city is Yangon, which used to be called Rangoon. Um, and a uh, very large city, a uh, wonderful country, but in fact one of the poorest countries uh, in Southeast Asia at present. So the GDP per capita as of 2017 in uh, Myanmar was about $1,300 US. So that's, uh, that's very, very low. That's uh, below um, any other country in, in that immediate region, below Laos uh, and uh, below Thailand, of course, certainly. So, um, and many of you will also know that uh, Myanmar has had a, a very tumultuous history, um, only having emerged from uh, really what I would call the shadows, hence the name of the talk, um, since maybe 2011, actually having an active uh, ability for folks to visit and, and, and to see the country, and, and, and there's still lots and lots of work to do. So, as a result of this, uh, this turmoil and political isolation, um, and also government corruption, um, it's really been stagnant for, for many, many years. And um, for, for a long time, as I would, uh, I, would uh, um, I guess, allude to, um, it, has, it has been that way, or had been that way. But recently what's happened, uh, to my amazement, when I first visited, um, was that it's, it's really starting to change. It's changing dramatically. It's changing on the ground uh, in a very grassroots kind of way. And a good chunk of that is uh, because of changes in technology, in particular, access to cell phones. So uh, Myanmar, surprisingly now, in 2019, has the highest smartphone penetration rate in uh, all of Southeast Asia. Um, really, despite the fact that they have this low GDP, um, they have a tremendously active Facebook community. And so if you're, if you're stopping someone on the street and you just say, uh, hey, do you use the internet? They would, they would likely say, um, I use Facebook. What is, you know, what is this internet of which, you, of which you speak? Facebook is, they're almost synonymous in many cases for many people. But nonetheless, uh, through cheap access to smartphones and to uh, widespread cellular connectivity, uh, lots of things are starting to change. Um, and a key aspect of this is the fact that people can now communicate readily, and um, that's creating political momentum that perhaps was not there before or couldn't be organized before. So it's a very, very exciting time, uh, I think, to, uh, to be in, my, in Myanmar and to see the changes. All right, so oh, I'm just going to point out to you guys, in case you don't know, the capital city, Yangon, is located in the south, uh, not too far from the, uh, the border with Thailand. Okay, so what was this all about? Well, as I said, I was lucky enough to visit, and when I visited for the first time, uh, I was also lucky enough to find out about uh, a very unique organization that is working in Myanmar, uh, in Yangon, and they're called Pandiar, uh, which literally means creation space or creation place. And uh, it's something that if you had asked me when I was going to the country initially, I would have said, uh, if, you, if you asked me to guess what I would find, this is probably one of the last things I would have had on my list. Uh, they are a community tech hub uh, that's actually fostering really a, uh, a nascent tech ecosystem in Myanmar. So they are a startup accelerator, if you can believe that. Um, they run uh, several things. They run an accelerator division, they run a makerspace, they run a co-working space in downtown Yangon, 
and uh, they're managed largely by local tech workers. So folks who are local and who are very interested in tech and uh, applying tech to a lot of real world problems that uh, involve things like social justice. So it's also a pretty, a pretty interesting organization, it's quite unique. Um, so they have a presence uh, in Yangon, and now spreading throughout Myanmar, and um, again, it's something you probably wouldn't necessarily expect to find, but you, you in fact do. They have launched a large number of startups, uh, primarily based around mobile connectivity, uh, to do a whole bunch of things from, from monitoring of environmental issues to, to waste uh, and many other things. But uh, back in 2017, they decided that one of the great things that they could do to help encourage youth in the country was to get uh, students involved in robotics. And again, you think uh, students perhaps did not have sufficient resources to become involved. In fact, with access to the internet, uh, they have a lot of information, they have a ton of information. They just don't always have the guidance or necessarily the, um, the expert knowledge that they might require to, to, to go on and do some more interesting things. So in 2017, uh, Pandiar helped to send a group of local students from uh, several local universities to the first Global Robotics Olympics. Um, and they actually came in sixth place. More than 170 teams. First time they'd ever entered the competition, they came in sixth. So uh, fantastically exciting. And that was so exciting that it made the national news uh, throughout the entire country. So people were ecstatic. They were amazed and ecstatic. Look, this small team, six people from Yangon, uh, students, no previous robotic experience, they went to a global, international competition, came back sixth. On the front page of several newspapers, type of thing. Uh, and so since then, Pandiar has really been interested in pushing uh, robotics education, and robotics as an, as an intro to tech, to STEM, um, to all these great things, um, and still using a minimal number of resources because, I mean, there's not, uh, there's not a lot available, but you can do a lot with a little in many cases, and I think that's their... Um, that's their, uh, their, their motivation. Really. So, so I was lucky enough to uh, be able to become involved with PenDR and to remain involved with them. Um, and um, in a second visit last year, I was able to go, or so I should say earlier this year, I was actually able to go back last, uh, last academic year. I was able to go back for one week and give a short course on uh, robotics to about 25 undergrad students from primarily the Yangon area. Uh, and this was all made possible by support from the RES site. So thanks to Raj, I think Raj just left the room, but um, thanks to Raj and to everyone at the RES site. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible without them, it wouldn't have been possible to go uh, and get this started. But uh, the idea was to, to test the waters for just having an exchange of idea where some set of experts, hopefully um, uh, folks from outside of the country, were able to come in, transfer some knowledge, and... and uh, give the students something they might not have otherwise uh, or have access to otherwise and then see what the results were. And so I can tell you from the pilot program that I said ran this year, um, we had a tremendous response. I had a tremendous response. The students were uh, captivated. I was humbled, in fact, by uh, these, these 25 students and that was the minimum, or sorry, that was the maximum number that could fit in the room. Uh, they had more folks that wanted to come. But uh, these 25 students, uh, came after hours, um, after the regular university classes, and spent a week with me for three or four hours a night uh, just working on, on, uh, on code, effectively. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought I might have to um, handhold some folks through Python uh, programming, and instead, I was schooled. Um, <laughs> they came in asking me, what, what, you said you need to install NumPy 1.14, but I've got 1.16, is that going to work? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I probably. I don't know. I, geez, I'm still I'm learning Python myself again right now. So, uh, just really, really, uh, really stunning. So the the appetite is there, um, the, the skill set is there. Uh, it's really just um, an ability to inject knowledge and then abilities uh, to give students opportunities. And so I think um, if if that can be done, then there are huge opportunities. I won't spend too much time on the curriculum. It was just a short course. We had one week. So we focused on, and I think Wolfram, uh, I'll maybe catch him later, uh, I have a lot of prospective employees for him. Um, mm -hmm. We focused on self-driving cars uh, because lots of folks were very interested in self-driving tech. Like one of the things they would see on the news all the time, uh, online, Facebook, etc., was self-driving vehicles. And so one of the most, 
uh, pressing things they wanted to know more about the self-driving cars. So that's where we focused the, the, the curriculum. So basically a week of the background, vision for driving, um, how you actually drive a vehicle, right? multi-sensor fusion, et cetera. So, and then one, one full lesson of just hands-on hacking with Python, as I said, to actually build things. Okay, so I was fascinated by this whole thing, and uh, if anybody would like to uh, talk to me more about it, I'd be happy to share my experience, and uh, you know, hopefully, um, if we're lucky, the idea is to be able to replicate these types of things with support from the RES site or from other groups. Um, sustainability is always an issue, but um, I think that the opportunities are dramatic. The most important thing uh, I would like to see uh, is a follow-up study in a couple of years, if we're able to do this over several years, which is the plan, um, is a follow-up study that actually determines whether this has had a significant positive impact. And I would love to say now that these students have, have, have gotten something that will hopefully be valuable to them. I don't have that data yet, but I hope to have it in the next couple of years. And I would love to come back and, and be able to tell you that these students you know, got great jobs or started something in Myanmar building low-cost autonomous vehicles, for example. So we'll see. Um, nonetheless, students, as I said, extremely excited. Uh, on the whole, um, I was just delighted to be a part of this. Pandiar is extremely interested in uh, reaching out to other uh, international experts in all areas of robotics, not just self-driving cars. So if you are interested and you would like me to put in touch, please let me know. It's easy to do, and they would be ecstatic to speak with you. If you're ever going on a trip and you can spend a couple of days uh, for a lecture there, uh, they would love it. They would absolutely love it. Um, as a final note, the last thing we're thinking about now uh, for, for next year um, is uh, Ducky Town. So if anybody's familiar with Ducky Town and Ducky Bots, little uh, yellow rubber ducks that drive on small uh, robot cars, which are relatively inexpensive in small ducky villages. No one probably... <laughs> it might sound strange, but it exists. Uh, it's a fantastic little platform for teaching uh, students, um, undergrads, even graduate level students, about uh, autonomous driving, deep learning, um, neural nets, a whole bunch of different things. So our plan for 2020 is to try and get a, a ducky town, uh, which would have a ducky town probably a uh, on Pagoda, which is the, the uh, image you see here, um, all in model, in miniature, and have students actually program several of these ducky bots to drive around um, model streets in Yangon, actually. Um, so that's the aim for next year. Uh, we're hoping it works out. Just looking for various ways to fund that, in fact. And so I was left, um, I'll, leave, I'll leave you just with one, with, uh, with one photo that was sent to me by Joao, who is the uh, marketing manager at uh, Pandiar. I also co-author on the short abstract he wrote for, for this. Uh, this is one of the students in the course, uh, and this is uh, in the uh, Pandiar office at 11 p.m. on a Friday, uh, the last day of the course. And I'd gone back to my hotel uh, so I'd actually left, um, and Joao came over and asked the student what, what on earth he was doing uh, at 11 p.m. Uh, on a Friday um, when the rest of the, the place was closed, and when I got home, and, he, and the student said, well, uh, we were lucky, you know, uh, this, this professor came over, gave us some great tools, and in this particular case he was hacking common filter code, um, apparently, and, and his take was that, well, I have these tools, now I have to make it happen. So here he is, 11 p.m. on a Friday, uh, hacking things, understanding, making it happen. So that's pretty compelling. Um, anyway, so I'll close with that. Uh, thank you very much. And as I said, if you're interested, really, I'm, I'm, it's kind of a sales pitch <laughs> in part in that I would, I would love to have more people get involved. Maybe not, not just in Myanmar, but Myanmar is a great place to start. So if you are interested, please, please don't hesitate to speak. Thanks very much. Probably one question. Yes, in the back, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Uh, have you seen applications in Myanmar where people went out um, and took the robots and applied it to local problems? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So, um, not as much, not as much as I would hope, not yet. Um, that's right. So, um, almost all of the the startups that have spun out of Pandiar have been based around mobile mobile cellular tech, so uh, apps, effectively. Um, and they are looking at other things, but not yet. However, and, and you, sir, as I, I know this gentleman, uh, you may in fact be interested that um, the most recent 
connection that's been made is between Pandiar and We Robotics. And they are actually looking at the possibility of establishing a flying lab in Yangon to do exactly this, environment monitoring. So we should talk more about that potentially afterwards. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. So in one of the papers of the, the group of students, I noticed it was like there was two boys and two oh. girls. So I'm wondering if this like the demographics for male, the, the gender ratios, what were they like? And yeah, you, okay, so I actually, you know what, you ask a fantastic question, so I'm going to go back to the front slide as well, because this is the actual class of uh, the 25, uh, I think there's 23 in this photo, but this is the class uh, that was there um, to, to actually take the course, and uh, you know, I, didn't, I didn't count exact numbers, but uh, surprisingly, and, and speaking to uh, uh, the previous talk, the, the ratio, the, the male-female ratio is actually uh, substantially better, I would say, than we are doing in North America. Uh, so um, I'm not sure if it's cultural, and this would be a fascinating thing to study, whether it's, it's just cultural, but uh, including the team that went on to, to win the uh, uh, first, uh, first Olympiad, 50% um, girls, yes, and the other teams have gone, yeah. I guess I was just wondering, you know, it's more of a, maybe a blank slate situation. Yes. I think you would have I, I would, if I had to guess, I would say you hit the nail exactly on the head. That a lot of that, uh, a lot of the, yes, a lot of that culture, that cultural background, just doesn't exist. And everybody realizes that's one of the things. Sorry, I keep talking, but one of the things people do realize very clearly when you speak with them is that uh, technology is prosperity. And that that they've seen what's happened with smartphones. They've seen how. They change who they can talk to, what they can do, what news they can get, um, you know, what how the government has been influenced to be a little more open, and so I think um, everyone is interested. And so there's not there's yeah there's maybe some of those traditional barriers are just sort of pushed aside because people realize hey um, I you know who, regardless of who I am I know if I can get into tech and start doing things in this space I'm likely to you know, be prosperous hopefully bring bring some prosperity back, help my family, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Great question. Another thing to, to look into. Okay. <laughs> I just to follow up to what they were talking about. Um, well, I, I guess I'd just like to add that, like, in developing countries, a lot of the time, gender ratios are different in rural versus urban areas. And Myanmar has a history of income inequality. So, like, what you do see in the cities isn't reflective of what of how people get themselves out of poverty. So it's normally the men in rural areas who get sent to colleges to do things like this, whereas women aren't even given the opportunities. But if they're lucky and they're born in a city with like you know with money, then it's a better situation. So I just like to, I just wanted to add to that. Yep, yep, and I think that's completely fair. And I, I would also I would add that um, yes. So in fact, in terms of the demographic that we were able that I was able to interface with, I was able to interface with here. Um, it is likely not representative fully. It is it is mostly folks from the Yangon or Greater Yangon area. Which is a large city, and so exactly, you do get. Uh, the, the, I think the demographic would be very different if you're pulling in people from rural communities. Um, one bright side is that one of the last things PenDR did was launch another national robotic competition, where they they pulled 35 universities from around the entire country and had them all compete for a chance to then come to Yangon and go off to the next first Olympiad. So maybe, hopefully. It's still hard to say, right? Because it is a, it is still a privileged thing. Even access any kind of education is a privilege. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but you know, hopefully, yeah, yeah. some small steps towards making some progress. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Well, it's time to speak, Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh.